You are listening to Meet the Thriller Author, the podcast where I interview writers of mysteries, thrillers, and suspense books. I am your host, Alan Peterson, and this is episode number 88. In this episode of the podcast, we'll be meeting Lee Goldberg, who is a two-time Edgar Award and Seamus Award nominee, and the number one New York Times bestselling author of more than 30 novels, including Washington Post bestsellers Killer Thriller and True Fiction, as well as King City, The Walk, 15 Monk Mysteries, and the internationally bestselling Fox and O'Hare books, co-written with Janet Ivanovich. Lee has also written and or produced scores of TV shows, including Diagnosis Murder, Sequest, Monk, and The Glades and he co-created the hit Hallmark movie series, Mystery 101. His latest novel, Lost Hills, will be published on January 1st, 2020, and it features a compelling new character, Eve Ronan, who is an ambitious young LA County Sheriff's detective who is in over her head, but is determined to prove herself, even if it costs her life. I really enjoyed this book. It's uh, out on January 1st, 2020. Highly recommend you go check it out. We're gonna talk about uh, the book, and Lee's amazing career and a whole lot more coming right up in my interview with Lee Goldberg. In this episode of the podcast, I have best-selling author Lee Goldberg on the phone. Lee, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing just great. I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast this morning. I really appreciate it. I've been trying so hard to get on. I've been bombarding you with letters. I've been offering you bribes. I'm glad it finally worked, that the begging finally succeeded. What can I say? You wore me down. (laughs) And actually, for the listeners, uh, it's uh, actually the other way around. Uh, But so glad to have you here. I wanted to ask you, I was checking out your website, and I've discovered that you come from a family of writers and artists. Uh, What was that like? And was there anyone in particular in your family that inspired you to become a writer yourself? Well, our family's highly competitive. I'm the oldest, so I have the edge. But my father was a television anchorman on the, on the San Francisco station when I was growing up. My mom was a society editor for the local newspaper. My father talked like this his entire life, always as if he was on the air, ready to give a report, which is funny for about five seconds. It gr- it's grating after decades. But television and writing were always you know, big things in our lives. They were always there. So it never seemed like something out of reach. So I was writing stories and, and um, articles and stuff from a very early age. In fact, I put myself through college writing about the film and television industry for Los Angeles the Kid, American Film, Starlog Magazine, a bunch of others. And my first novel was when I was 19. So I, I got a very early start. And that really inspired my brother. He figured, well, if, if Lee can do it, I can do it. And my brother has written a whole bunch of books. He's a New York Times bestselling author and... Uh, Amazon just announced that they're developing a TV series based on one of his books, so he's doing great. And my two younger sisters, although they don't write fiction, they write nonfiction about um, art and uh, uh, scrapbooking and things like that. So we're we're a very artistic family. That must make a very interesting uh, family reunions. My brother Todd actually writes uh, crime fiction as well, so sometimes we we, uh, step on each other's toes. There was one great week, though, a couple years ago, when we both had brand new books out and we were both on the New York Times bestseller list together. I was number one and he was number six. It was just so great. It was just, it was a dream come true for both of us. And I'm sure you didn't rub it in or anything that you were uh, number one, he was number six in the New York Times bestselling list. Oh, of course I did. Of course I did. You know, maybe someday you'll make it as high as me. But to be fair, both Todd and I were holding on to other people's coattails. My number one book was co-authored with Janet Ivanovich, and Todd's number six book was co-authored with Brad Meltzer. So we couldn't brag too much about our positions because on the list because they weren't entirely due to our name recognition, but rather the name recognition of the authors we were working with. So you published your first thriller as a 19-year-old. I believe it was the uh, 357 Vigilante. You are using a pen name? By Ian Ludlow. So I'll be on the shelf next to Robert Ludlum. And Ian Fleming, so people would go, Ian Fleming! Ian Ludlow. I, you know, I think I've read something by him. It wasn't bad. <laughs> Sounds like a sound strategy. And now I know where you came up with the uh, character name for your Ian Ludlow thriller series. Yeah, so I did that as a little homage to myself. 
This might sound a bit mean, but I chuckled reading on your website that the publisher of your first book, The 357 Vigilante, went out of business uh, soon after publishing it, and you never saw diamond royalties. That's a rough start in the business. Did that give you pause? Did it make you reconsider a career as a novelist? It made me take a huge pause. I got out of the business, uh, at least the publishing business. Um, after Pinnacle Books went out of business and took my Vigilante series, which was a bestseller with them, along with all of my royalties, I focused primarily on my television career. And I wrote and produced hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of television. Hunter, Diagnosis, Murder, Baywatch, Sequest, Spencer for Hire, The Glades, Monk, a bunch of shows. And around um, the books I wrote as a as a teenager came out in the mid-80s. And around 1994, 95, somewhere in there, I got nominated for an Edgar Award for one of my television scripts. And my book agent, who I thought had forgotten I even existed, called me up and said, hey, you got an Edgar nomination. That's like the Oscars of mystery writing. If you were to write a book proposal, I could get you a three-book deal by the end of the week. Okay. So I, I was stuck in a hotel room in Canada at the time doing a terrible show called Cobra starring Michael Dudikoff. And I wrote this this proposal about the mob bringing their style of business to television. They don't cancel shows. They kill them. I just you know, hacked out this thing really quick, and my agent got me a three-book deal. So in 1994, 95, somewhere in there, um, I was back in publishing with a book called My Gun Has Bullets. It was released by St. Martin's Press. And then I did a follow-up called um, Beyond the Beyond. And then, uh, again, I didn't write... Uh, novels for quite some time, and, and again, I got pulled back in because of TV. Um, Diagnosis Murder, a TV show I, I uh, was the head writer on and executive producer, Penguin Putnam was doing books based on murder she wrote, and they looked at Diagnosis Murder and said, hey, that could be another great franchise for us, and offered me a deal to write Diagnosis Murder novels. So I got back in. I wrote uh, eight Diagnosis Murder novels, and then I subsequently wrote 15 Monk novels, and also a few original novels in between. So there was a period where I did the two careers simultaneously, writing for TV and producing for TV and um, writing books. That must have been challenging, uh, writing for uh, both uh, television and, and for uh, books. Uh, is there a big difference between uh, writing the, for the two? Oh, there's a massive difference. They're two entirely different mediums. On television, a story is conveyed through action and dialogue, whereas in a book, you're everything. You're the director, you're the, the wardrober, you're the, the actors, you're everybody. And, and it's told through prose and uh, in, internal monologue and, and, and multiple points of view. You are the, the entire universe. And television, what you're writing as a script, is essentially a blueprint um, that other talented people use to do their work. It's, it's more like being a contractor. A few months ago, I interviewed D.P. Lyle for the podcast, and he shared that you're the one who got him into the world of tie-in novels uh, when you passed on uh, writing the novels for the uh, Royal Pains uh, TV show. Well, yeah, Doug and I are old friends. He's actually my doctor. He was also, also my consultant on medical consultant on diagnosis murder. He and I have been friends for decades. So Royal Pains, the TV show about a doctor, and I thought Doug would be perfect for it. Now he hates me because I put him through that. He has me do all kinds of unnecessary medical tests just to torture me. <laughs> yeah, he just seemed to prefer to write in his own universe. Um, are you still writing tie-in novels? And uh, do you prefer to write stories set in your own universe? No, I'm not doing any tie-ins, but I, I still do a lot of television. And I prefer to write my own books, but I'm very comfortable writing um, characters created by others because that's 90% of what you do in television. You don't usually create the shows you're working on, and you end up, channeling the artistic point of view of whoever is running the show that you're working on. So that's something I'm familiar with and, and uh, enjoy doing. So uh, I, in terms of books, I prefer to write my own books. In television, it's the nature of the game that you're primarily writing uh, characters other people created, except now I have my own series on Hallmark called Mystery 101. I'm not producing it, but I uh, co-created it with my friend Robin Bernheim, and we've written a couple of the movies and there are other movies being written by others uh, in this series. Oh, yeah. I've seen that uh, advertised on the on television. Uh, I didn't realize you were behind that. Uh, what's the uh, show about? Yeah, it's, a, it's about a woman who teaches mystery fiction at a, at a college and ends up solving crimes herself. Oh, it's like a cozy mystery. Yeah. Yeah, on Hallmark, they don't do much hardcore stuff. 
<laughs> That's true. It's not part of the uh, Hallmark brand. So I really enjoyed reading the advanced uh, copy that I received for Lost Hills, uh, which is going to be published in uh, January of 2020. Um, the ambience, the characters, especially Eve Ronin, um, it was a great read. Uh, how did that story uh, and character of Eve Ronin come into being for you? It came out sideways. I mean, it wasn't something I set out to write. I had a whole different cop novel in mind that I wanted to do. And as part of the research for that novel, I went... I finagled my way into a homicide investigators training conference in Wisconsin. These are training seminars held for professional homicide investigators to bring them up to date on the latest techniques and, and things. It, it, the homicide detectives are required to take 24 hours of training every year to recertify, just to keep them up to date. So I finagled my way into one of these conferences. I was one of only two civilians invited. And... I just want to get some color and some details and some techniques. I, I really wasn't going to get a new story. I was going to enhance the one I had. But one of the cases presented at that conference, presented as an example of a case that would not have been solved if you walked into it using any police common sense. You had to enter it as if you'd, you'd never solved a case before. It was a bizarre, really fascinating case. I could not get it out of my head. And I decided I would throw out the book I was doing and write about that. And since the case required the detective in order to solve it, to, to throw away everything they already knew, I thought, what if my hero, my, hero, my lead character, was um, a brand-new detective, somebody who had no prior experience to draw upon, which was a stretch because homicide detectives usually are experienced in other areas that are promoted to homicide. Homicide is a uh, position detectives strive to, to uh, achieve. So I thought, what if I have a character who gets the job, not because of experience, but through politics? And I, and I had just I had been longing, in a way, to get back to a voice I used in the Monk novels. I wrote the Monk novels from the first-person point of view of a woman, and I really liked that character. So I thought I'd make my new character a woman and, and just add to her problems. So <laughs> it, it, it was her new job. So she'd have a glass ceiling and, and, and have deal with sexism and... So that, that's how Eve Ronan was born. Eve Ronan is the youngest female homicide detective in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And she gets her job not because of experience, but because as a detective in a different uh, bureau, she was in, in burglaries in Lancaster, she was just riding her bike on, in, uh, in the mountains in Mulholland and witnessed a uh, Academy Award-winning movie star beating the shit out of his girlfriend, <laughs> and she interceded, and there were people who witnessed it, and the video went viral, and suddenly she was a celebrity. A celebrity at the time, at a time when the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department was enduring a lot of scandal about beatings at the prisons and, and, and whatnot. So to, to get more positive press and to keep that story in the news rather than the scandalous stories, the sheriff promotes Eve to homicide. So, yeah, so now she's in a job that she didn't earn, um, resented by the detectives around her, resented not only because she got this job without the merit, but also because she's a woman, and she's only in her 20s. And then she lands this triple homicide case that will either is going to make her career or reveal that she's a total fraud who doesn't deserve the badge. So it, it added a lot of interesting levels to the story, and I, just, I was really swept up in it. I, I really enjoyed writing that book. And it was based on a true, uh, a true crime, and I was able to contact all the detectives and forensic investigators and medical examiners and prosecutors involved in that case uh, to get more information and, and uh, facts that would help me tell my fictional version. Yeah, and I was surprised to learn that Lost Hills is based on a real-life case from Ohio, right? Yes, and the real case is so bizarre that had I written it verbatim, no one would have believed it. It, just, it was so outrageous. So I, I toned down some of the more outrageous stuff. I actually didn't tone it down. I took it out and focused on some other of the bizarre stuff that was in the book and, and streamlined it. And moving it to L.A. also made some changes. So it's, it's more like a law and order story in that it's ripped from the headlines. It's inspired by a real case, but I took an awful lot of liberties with it. And yet the things in my book that may come across as the most bizarre are actually the stuff that's true, <laughs> that actually happened in the real case. Wow, so in that case, it does seem that the truth was uh, stranger than fiction. <laughs> yes, and, and I knew if I tried to write about the cases that originally played out, nobody would buy it. They would think, oh, come on, that could never happen. So I, I had to really tone it down. 
Uh, you mentioned earlier that you actually spoke to the actual law enforcement personnel that was involved in the real case in Ohio, including the detectives and a blood splatter analyst. Uh, did you find them being receptive to talking to you, to talking to a writer? They were very receptive, and they understood exactly what I was doing, and they, they really liked it. Um, in fact, they, they felt that the novel tells the story in some ways more truthfully than uh, a particular nonfiction book that came out around the time that the actual case occurred. Looks like you did a lot of research for Lost Hills. Is that always a big part of your writing process? It's one of the most exciting aspects of writing any book for me, because all my books require me to learn about a world I know nothing about. So I end up doing quite a bit of research, whether it's it's about something as bizarre as, not bizarre, but um, about paper currency, people collect paper currency, or if it's about the catacombs of, of Paris or whatever. I, I do a lot of travel, and I do a lot of research, because I believe that it adds uh, a level of reality that makes the unbelievable stuff believable. Do you prepare an outline before you start to write, or do you just start to write the story? Oh, I'm, I'm an outliner, no question about it. I'm not one of these guys who writes 600-page you know, outlines. My outlines are about 12 pages, and I call them living outlines because I finish the outline about a week or two before I finish the book. I'm always revising the outline as I go. The outline is a roadmap. It tells me where I'm going, but it doesn't mean I can't make side trips along the way. And the reason I'm always revising my outline is I'm always making new decisions as I go, so it impacts the way the plot unfolds. But I think it's essential to have an outline when you're doing a, a murder mystery. So the clues are all there, that the story makes sense. You don't want to be making that up as you go along. And I can always tell when I'm reading a book uh, that's a murder mystery when the author is just making it up as they go along. It doesn't all fit together. The ending feels stitched together in a crazy way. And, I, and you can almost see the writer treading narrative water while he tries to figure out where to go next, and I hate that. So I, my, my books are always tightly plotted, and then I go back and, and rewrite and tighten up. I like a real tight book. Yes, that's something I enjoy from your books. They're Like you said, they're very tightly written and real page turners. The story just uh, goes on from page to page and you want to know what's going to happen. And um, so, yes, yeah, so that's uh, I really enjoy that. Well, my feeling is that every scene, to use something from TV and film, every scene should reveal character or further the plot or it shouldn't be there. Every line of dialogue should reveal character or further the plot or shouldn't be there. So I cut a lot of stuff, even stuff that I find amusing or emotional that I don't think really moves the story along. And plus, I think every book has its own beat, its own rhythm. I, it's almost like a piece of music, its own pace. And I, sometimes I cut scenes just because I feel it's slowing the, the beat. It, it, it's, not, it, it's out of step, and the rhythm is lost. So I, I do feel a real sense of... of of, of the musicality in a way of, of a story and cut scenes for those purposes or dialogue for those purposes. Not to spoil anything here, but there was a massive wildfire that rages through the Santa Monica Mountains in your book, in Lost Hills. That fire was fictional when you wrote it, but fiction became reality with the Woolsey Fire in November of 2018. And I read that you even had to evacuate as you were working on the book. How surreal was that? And hopefully everything's okay with your family and your home? It was absolutely surreal. So I had written about this fire that sweeps through the Santa Monica Mountains and about Canaan Doom Road turning into this tunnel of flame, and I made it all up. And I got my galleys a couple days before the wildfires, the Woolsey Fire erupted here. I live in Calabasas, erupted here in Southern California. I found myself evacuated and editing my book, editing the scenes about the wildfire. At the same time, I'm seeing the wildfire on screen in the places I wrote about. It's like, oh, my description was actually quite accurate. <laughs> it, was, it was surreal. Um, the fire came right up to our back fence, but our home our home was fine. But still, it was, it was so strange to have something I only imagined fictionally actually occur, and then to be editing those descriptions while watching it happen. It was just weird. Yeah, that reminds me of Tom Clancy. I read that uh, how several of the things that he had predicted in his book actually came true in real life in the future. This happens to me all the time, particularly with my Ian Ludlow novels. I write these outrageous spy situations, and, and they come true. They all come true. And what's really frustrating is the book I have coming out in April, Fake Truth, the third book in the Ian Ludlow series, the stuff was coming true while I was writing the book. I had to keep rewriting my book because I didn't want my book to feel like old news, but the rewriting 
it, it got to the point where it looked like I'd missed my deadline. So I finally had to just accept the fact that some of what I was writing about was going to become true. And sure enough, so much of what's in fake truth has happened now that I've had to put an afterword on there saying, it wasn't ripped from the headlines. It was all fictional when I came up with it a year ago. It was. Oh, wow. <laughs> like what kind of things? Oh, these deep fake videos that they're talking about, those are in my book, but they weren't news at the time. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Um, it's really frustrating. It was so fresh and original when I wrote about it. Now I look at it, it's like, well, people are already reading about it in the news. Oh, man, yeah, that's got to be so frustrating. <laughs> so I noticed uh, the second book in the uh, Eve Ronin series, uh, titled Bone Canyon, is already scheduled to be published in 2021. Yeah, it's already written. Can you give us a little sneak peek of what it's about? Yes, that book picks up three weeks after the end of Lost Hills. You don't have to have read Lost Hills to, to follow Bone Canyon, but it picks up three weeks later in the aftermath of the wildfires and the flames that have swept through uh, Santa Monica Mountains have revealed a whole bunch of bodies, bones, and all these old uh, missing persons and murders are coming to light. And that's based on reality. After the fire swept through here, and cleared away all the underbrush and canyons and things, they found cars, bodies, airplanes, all kinds of things that had been lost over the decades um, in the canyons and stuff. The the canyons were revealing their dead. I thought that was just so fascinating. A woman who disappeared 10 years ago, uh, wandering out of a museum, her body was found. They found the bodies of gang members. They found a couple who disappeared on their way back from LAX a few years ago. They found all the. They found a plane crash. They never knew happened. They're trying to figure out what the plane is, and so many things that were lost um, and buried in under all this brush, uh, invisible from view, until the fires swept through and denuded the mountains. So um, it was a natural uh, opportunity for me to write a sequel. Oh, that's fascinating. I hadn't uh, heard about that before. Um, looking forward to that book. Well, it's also interesting because you know, some of these bodies fell or were thrown off canyons into the brush and were caught in bushes on steep inclines. So after the fire, these body, these, these bones rolled down into into flatlands, into people's yards or into canyons. So they not in the places they originally were, but well below where they'd been deposited. So it, it, there were a debris field of, of bones in some cases. So it's, it's very interesting stuff. Oh, wow, that is interesting. I can see why you wanted to write about that. Exactly. It was you know, irresistible to me. Before I let you go, I wanted to ask you about uh, Brash Books. I read The uh, Wind Chime Legacy a few years ago, and I didn't realize you were behind Brash Books. And I think it's so, so cool how, uh, how you're bringing back uh, awesome uh, old and out-of-print thrillers back to life and into digital print. Uh, such a cool story how Brash Books came to be. Uh, can you share it with the listeners? Yeah, Brash Books is a small publishing company I founded with my friend Joel Goldman, who's also an author. And we republish terrific crime novels, many of them multiple award-winning, highly acclaimed crime novels that have fallen out of print for various reasons, or books that had a huge influence on me and Joel as as writers as we were coming up. We also publish uh, original novels as well. But what's been exciting lately with Brash is all the lost manuscripts we've been discovering from authors that we've been publishing. We published an author named Ralph Dennis, who passed away in the, in the 1980s, but wrote this terrific series of paperbacks, the Hardman series, that inspired Joe Lansdale's Happen Leonard series and Shane Black's Lethal Weapon, that were obscure and few people knew about, but were very influential to a generation of crime writers. So I sought out the Hardman novels, I found his, Ralph Dennis's heirs, and I acquired the copyright, not just to his Hardman novels, but also all of his published and unpublished work. And I've been finding all these manuscripts of his that were never published and have been republishing them. And finally, Ralph is getting the acclaim he was denied in his lifetime, which is wonderful but also very sad that he never got to see it. But it's been a real thrill to be able to, to bring these books back. And there's another writer named Jimmy Sangster who's very well-known, more as a writer-director of Hammer Horror Films than as a novelist. But he... Um, he wrote a bunch of terrific crime novels in the 70s and 80s and passed away in the, in the mid-2012, like 2012, 2011, somewhere in there. And we've been republishing his out-of-print backlist and also stumbled on a novel of his that was never previously published, and we're publishing it in February. 
Oh, that is so cool that those authors are getting their due. Uh, so many uh, you know, old mass paperback books from from the 60s and 70s uh, that are no longer around. So it's so it's, it's great to see that uh, you're bringing them. You're bringing some of those back. Yeah, there's there's so many great books that have fallen out of print and are not available in in digital format um, out there. And we're just republishing a small fraction of those. But we've also published a lot of original novels that have gotten quite a bit of acclaim. One of our books. Double Wide by a guy named Leo Banks was a double Spur Award winner two years ago for Best Contemporary Western and Best New Novel. And he has a new book coming out in March called Champagne Cowboys. And it's been great to publish the first books by a new generation of crime writers as well. So it, it, we're on both sides of the coin. We're rediscovering and re releasing great books by wonderful crime writers of the past and introducing brand new crime writers who we hope to, will be big names in the future. I'm curious uh, what it's like for you to be on the other side of the table now, wearing the publisher hat. It's been fun. I, I've been able to take everything I've learned as a writer being published by multiple companies and use it to help other writers. Uh, Brash Books does not publish anything by me or Joel. It's not a vanity press. It's a full-fledged publisher. Our books get reviewed in Publishers Weekly and Booklist and all the trades and, it, and have been very well-reviewed. We've had a few star reviews in Publishers Weekly over the years. It's great fun. I mean, we aren't Random House or Simon & Schuster. We're a small publisher, but we really enjoy it. So what's the best place for our listeners to find you? Uh, LeeGoldberg.com? That's that place. Or walking the streets of Ventura Boulevard. <laughs> All right, Lee. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Meet the Thriller Author podcast. Be sure to visit thrillerauthors.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover great thrilling reads. If you enjoy the podcast, I'd love for you to subscribe, uh, rate, and give a review uh, to it, wherever it is that you're listening to this uh, podcast, be it uh, iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, uh, wherever it is that you're uh, listening to this right now, I would uh, appreciate it. And uh, please do check out my own thriller novels over at my website at alanpeterson.com. Until next time.